Nod with me if this sounds like you. Uh, when I write my list for the grocery store, I like to do it in the order that you're going to walk through the store. Because there's, like there's like a flow of traffic that you have to follow. Otherwise, the carts kind of go against you and it's just a big mess. You can't, you can't have that, right? You have, you have to have like a linear sequential strategy for getting through the, at least Trader Joe's. I don't know about other stores, but when I go to Trader Joe's, man, you got to follow the flow of the traffic or you're, you're toast. You can't get through the grocery store if you don't have a good, a good plan that follows uh, the, the flow. Um, but if you go to a new grocery store, a different one, or an open farmer's market kind of thing, it's just like good luck, figure it out. Zigzag, backtrack, take whatever you get, you know? Uh, I feel like this passage in 1 Peter 3 kind of does that to us. It's kind of a new grocery store, and things are, don't really seem uh, like they're in their logical place. The, the order, the flow of the text is a little bit confusing to us, at least modern readers. It's like the broccoli's at the butcher stand, you know, and the cleaning supplies are at the deli, and it doesn't make sense to us. But uh, I think that the master, the, the author of this, does have a flow in mind, an order, uh, uh, some logical sequence to this, um, and he is going to give us exactly what we need. By the end of this, our, our carriage, our cart on the West Coast, carriage here is, is going to be filled with exactly what God wants us to have today, okay? Uh, even though this is, it, we might take a confusing path to get there. Um, so as we go through it, I uh, I think we'll see Peter's strategy and his intent for his audience, as well as what God wants to encourage us with today. This is really a hope-filled, strengthening passage, even though there are a lot of kind of intimidating, confusing um, ideas that pop out of a, a, us at first read. Uh, this is a great passage. I think uh, today might be a little bit more technical the normal, because um, there's so many challenges in this text. This is considered one of, if not the most difficult text in the New Testament. So, you know, let's buckle up today. And uh, I think this will be fun, though. I love this, I love this passage, and um, I think it's fascinating um, and, and really nourishing for our souls. So let me start out first by um, trying to summarize it for us so that we can get, begin to get our minds around it a little bit. Here's what I think is going on. And by the way, I don't, I'm not like a huge note taker, but if you take notes, this would be a good day to take notes. There are a lot of details that you may want to track with, write down and follow up on later, uh, study more yourself uh, in the following weeks. Um, here's, you might want to jot some of these things down too. Here's what I think Peter is saying in this passage. Let's try to sort this out. I think Peter is saying that the righteous Christ suffered to bring unrighteous people to God and to proclaim his victory through his death and resurrection. We got that part. Uh, now, when we Christians realize that, we kind of get on the baptism boat, or ark, so to speak. We'll talk about what that means. We kind of get on the baptism boat by saying, Lord, I need that risen Christ. I need that risen and ruling king to save me, and to clean me, to cleanse me from the inside out. Then, well, you know, once we put our faith in Jesus, the suffering king, we, friends, are done being driven by sin, led along by sin. And now instead we walk by the will of God. Unfortunately, that means a lot of people around you, above you, in your relationship circles, uh, they're going to reject Jesus, which means they're also going to reject you. They're not going to like the fact that you've got to separate from sin and live a different kind of life. And so they're going to they're gonna reject you and rip on you. But... Don't worry, because they have to give account to God. They're going to be judged by God. That's what Peter's saying. So, even if that ripping on you, the persecution, the pressure that comes from all of that, from the different life that you live, even if that leads to martyrdom, even if you lose your life for being a Christian, you don't have to be afraid because you've received the gospel, you're alive spiritually in the new life that God gives you. That's what Peter's saying here. Let's tighten that down a little bit more, okay? Okay. The righteous and ruling king died and rose to bring us to God, to proclaim his victory, to clean us from the inside out, to be done with sin, to judge rebels, and to give us new life. Here's another way to look at it. The risen Christ brings us in, cleans us out. The risen Christ stops sin and gives us a new spiritual start. That's 1 Peter 3.18 to 4.6. And as we start to process this text and discover its meaning, we have to remember... Um, 
that this letter from Peter to these churches in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, it has been about preparation for pressure, oppression, bracing for unjust suffering, undeserved suffering, and mistreatment. Even when you're doing everything right as a Christian, living righteously as God's holy people because your Savior, Jesus Christ, was mistreated, misunderstood, and murdered, even though he was completely innocent. Your life is going to look like that. Even though he was innocent, righteous, and holy, he was mistreated and killed. So this passage, even with all of its confusing details and ideas, concepts in here, it's within that purpose of preparing the church for pressure. We've got to keep that in mind because that's going to help us sort it out a bit today. So in light of that, bottom line, this really fascinating Noah baptism, Jesus preaching to imprisoned spirits text is saying, the risen Christ brings us in, cleans us out, puts an end to sin, and gives us a new start, new life spiritually. And this prepares the church for living under pressure, okay? The first part of this idea that's on the screen now, that he brings us in, he cleans us out, that comes out in 3.18 to 22. We'll reread those in just a second, where you're going to see some really straightforward, familiar, solid, like, yeah, I got that kind of Christian teaching. You get some of that, but you also get some really challenging, confusing concepts as well. And we'll take some time to think and talk through that. Um, on, on the one hand, it's really clear that Jesus is righteous. He died for the unrighteous uh, th to bring us to God. And now Jesus is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers in submission to him. That's solid. We got that. That's not really confusing, complicated. That's basic Christian teaching. But after that, we might be kind of scratching our heads, wondering, what does it mean for Jesus to be made alive by the Spirit? Was he dead spiritually? That's weird. We got to talk about that. Uh, what does it mean for him to go preach to spirits in prison? That's crazy. Uh, and then the Noah story kind of comes in from left field out of nowhere. I'm like, well, what is this Noah baptism stuff about? We've got to talk about a lot of those details today. And as we dig into those tough verses, let's let the guide rail be, the guardrail be, that the risen Christ is the one who brings us into God and cleans us out. Let's take another look at that in verses 18 to 22. Look down at 18 to 22. For Christ died, suffered really, as Michelle read, for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, <clears throat> but made alive by the Spirit, through whom he also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Wow. Okay. What is clear in this is that the righteous king, that's what Christ means, Christ means king, the righteous king suffered for unrighteous people, that's you and me, praise the Lord, to bring us to God. We got that. Okay? He was put to death in the body. That makes sense. He died on the cross in a physical body on our behalf. Um, that makes sense. But when, what does it mean for him to be made alive in the spirit uh, or, or by the spirit? That's a tricky phrase. Well, first, I want to propose that we not actually... Is it capitalized, spirit capitalized in your Bible? For some of you, it might be. I want to propose that you don't actually capitalize spirit right there. It's not talking about the Holy Spirit. It's talking about spiritual, the spiritual realm, okay? It's not talking about the Holy Spirit raising Jesus back to life. And I'm saying that because the grammar, the syntax, meaning the sentence structure, uh, and the passages, other passages in the Bible don't support that. In fact, it's God the Father who's credited with raising Jesus back uh, from the dead. Peter and the apostles preached in Acts 5. Peter's the guy who wrote this. Peter and the apostles preached in Acts 5 that uh, the God of our fathers raised Jesus. Romans 6 and 8 teach that Christ is raised by God the Father. Galatians 1 says this. John 5 says it's the Father who raises people back to life. So I don't think Peter is saying that the Holy Spirit raised Jesus. He's not saying that um, for those reasons. It, it, in other parts of the New Testament don't teach that. 
As for the grammar and syntax, a little nerdy for a second, there are two prepositional phrases that need to be understood as balanced or kind of uh, contrasting counterparts. And those are put to death in flesh, made alive in spirit. Put to death in flesh, made alive in spirit. Those things are supposed to be kind of parallel and contrasting. Um, those are called locative datives. They describe the location where something is occurring. Um, they, they indicate place, location. They're describing two spatial aspects or the realms or places of Jesus' redemptive work. So that's, and that's really nerdy. But in other words, Peter is saying that Jesus was put to death in the fleshly realm on earth. We got that. But made alive in the spiritual realm. Jesus died on earth in the physical temporal realm, was raised to life, appeared to many people, including Peter, and then ascended to the heavenly spiritual realm in his glorified immortal body, where he did what verse 19 describes next. Okay? That's what it means for him to be made alive in the spirit. He was raised back to life, and then he ascended to heaven, and now he's alive in the spiritual realm. He ascended, okay? That's what that's talking about. Then in verse 19, and I've, you can look back down there if you want, through whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Okay? But as we just found out, it's not talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so we should understand this as saying, in which, you know, the, the spiritual realm in which Jesus went and proclaimed or preached. In the spiritual space, Jesus went and preached to the spirits in prison. That's what I'm proposing. It's talking about where Jesus did this work. Not through the Holy Spirit, but the space in which he did it. Okay? Um, even though we've got that sorted out, there are some other parts of this verse, these verses, that are really tricky and probably raising some questions we need to uh, deal with. Where is, where is prison? What is prison? Where, who are the spirits? And what, it, what was Jesus preaching? Is that like evangelism or something or something else? We'll talk about all these, okay? <clears throat> so first, what is prison? There's a line you might be familiar with in the Apostles' Creed uh, that says, Jesus descended into hell. You heard that before? Uh, after he died, but before he was raised back to life. I don't believe that's true. Jesus did not descend into hell. And that's not what this is teaching either. Peter didn't believe that. Jesus didn't descend into hell. Uh, the Bible doesn't teach that. This verse isn't saying it. Because this word for prison here in our passage, it never means hell. It doesn't mean hell. Um, hell is eternal punishment in the lake of fire in Revelation. It's the final, final thing that demons, uh, rebels against God get cast into. That's not what this is at all. But this prison term does refer to a place of captivity or restriction, a temporary holding. It's a different thing than hell, okay? It's a captivity place or restriction place for spirits. Who are those spirits? Next question. These spirits, quick answer, these are demons. These are fallen angels, demons who rejected God and sinned against God, were kicked out of God's space, and they're now kind of in jail, waiting for final punishment, judgment in Revelation. Now, Peter has some Old Testament um, and Jewish tradition material in the back of his mind here, behind what he's saying, um, but we, you don't even need to get into that. You can just look to verse 22 to, uh, to make it really clear who these spirits are. Look at that. Look at 22. Jesus, who has gone into heaven and is God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him, under his feet, underneath him. So the risen Christ went to heaven, the spiritual realm, and preached something, we'll talk about that, to the demons in prison under him. Is that making sense? That's, where this, that's what this is saying. That brings us to our third question. What is it that Jesus preached? What does preach mean? Our initial assumption is probably that this refers to some type of evangelism. Preaching is often coupled with that idea. Preaching the gospel. That's, that's how the word is used elsewhere. Um, and that's partially the case here. Uh, but it's not like Jesus is offering salvation to demons. He doesn't do that, certainly. He doesn't, uh, he's not preaching a forgiveness of sins to these fallen angels. Uh, Jesus is proclaiming the victory and judgment part of the gospel uh, over these demons. Jesus is proclaiming victory and judgment as the risen, the death-beating 
king over fallen angels and demons. It's Jesus ascending to the throne in heaven saying, I won. You guys lost. It's Jesus saying, I'm the king. You're not. Get under my feet. That's part of the gospel. Jesus is preaching, proclaiming that. That's the content of his sermon, so to speak, to these demons that he's speaking over. He's saying the game is over for you guys. I am the captain now. Okay? You don't own these people. I do. I bought them with my blood. I win. I have brought them into God with my righteous life, substitutionary death, and my victorious resurrection. I, Jesus, win. That's what he preached. That's what this passage is conveying here. This is all, this might seem uh, like we strayed away from a bit of the main point here, but this is all really part of the portrait of the risen Christ who brings us in and cleans us out. This is what the work of Jesus was. This is an aspect of, of uh, what he did on the cross and after he ascended into heaven um, that we don't often think about, you know, but it would, been, it would have been incredibly strengthening and encouraging, especially to first century Christians under pressure by the government by their neighbors, by their masters, like we talked about a few weeks ago, even their husbands. These Christians need to be lifted up by this truth, feeling like beaten up, mistreated, uh, misunderstood losers in the eyes of society. You know, Peter is saying to them, guys, your savior was also beaten up, misunderstood, mistreated, even killed. He also suffered unfairly, but he came out victorious, preaching his win over even demons. Ah, What a heart-lifting truth that Peter's church needed to hear. This is what Peter's saying. He's saying, guys, that is your king. It would be so encouraging and strengthening for them, as I hope it is for us today, too. I think it's even empowering in our context today, in our space, you know, partly for social and cultural pressure, but also, more specifically, in our region of, the, of New England, uh, for spiritual oppression. And I talk about this often, um, but it's real. And I really do try to listen to the Spirit as I pray and prepare my sermons. And I'm sensing that we need to hear this today. So um, if you have ever felt or experienced demonic activity, um, you may have been a little bit creeped out by that or intimidated. You know, that's understandable. I mean, some of you may see it regularly walking down the streets of Salem. These verses in 1 Peter 3 are saying to you that Jesus has brought us to God who is protecting us. He's announced his victory and superiority over superiority over that through his death and resurrection. That, this means that God's people are spiritually protected in his arms forever. The demons can't get inside of you and possess you and oppress you like that from inside if the Holy Spirit is in you, protecting you. Because Jesus has brought you into God. This means you don't have to fear the adversary, Satan, demons, witchcraft, any spiritual opposition to you or your faith or the church even, because Jesus has already announced his victory over all that. This means that whenever you're startled or scared by dark, fallen spiritual forces, you can go back to this verse, this truth, this reality, and remember that Jesus says, hey, I'm in charge. I win. I'm the king. I already beat that. This stuff is under my foot. Remember that. That's what this is speaking into your heart, your mind, your situation. If you are feeling uh, oppressed by dark spiritual forces, if you're startled and afraid of that, pray this when you're afraid. Let the Spirit pour it over you when you're under pressure and opposition. Let these brief moments of intimidation and kind of uh, being spooked, let that actually renew your confidence, okay, in Jesus who died and rose to bring you to God and proclaim to the spirits in prison his victory over sin death, darkness, and evil, okay? That's your Savior. This is what he did. This is how it's real for us right now in this place, this moment. It's why we need this. It's when we need this. I think Peter's readers needed this primarily for social pressure, for political pressure, persecution that was to come a couple years later from Nero, because they probably felt like a very weak minority, you know, overwhelmed by sinful, pagan, Uh, oppressive, heavy-handed culture. They probably felt like eight faithful people in a, in a world uh, disobeying God as his judgment begins to rain down. That's where the Noah story kind of comes in, right? Make sense? Felt like a faithful minority getting beaten up, made fun of, 
That's part of why Noah, uh, Peter brings it in Noah in the next few verses. We'll look at 20 and 21 again, and then we're going to talk about what that means. It picks up in the middle of verse 19 sentence um, that the ascended and enthroned Jesus proclaimed to the imprisoned angels, look at verse 20, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus brings us in and cleans us out. Peter is saying that through the lens of Noah, flood water, and baptism, that Jesus brings us in and cleans us out. And I think he's doing that because they were in this region that Peter's writing to. There were these extra biblical stories, non-biblical stories, um, about kind of folklore, about Noah and the flood that were popular in this region of Asia Minor, or modern day Turkey. There was this thought that the ark had landed there in one of the cities in this region, actually. Um, so Noah was very popular. He was well known in this region, um, even though their stories about him weren't really true. They, they didn't really line up with scripture. But the name, the idea, uh, the legend of Noah was, was popular in this region. So he knew this was a big deal to them. Noah was so well known, actually, that Noah's face and his wife's face were, were printed on the money in 2nd and 3rd century AD. He's like, he's like our George, the George Washington, Abraham Lincoln kind of thing. Very, everybody knew, you know? Everybody knew something about Noah. Uh, Peter knew this. He understood this was, the, this was the background, the culture of his readers, and he was writing into that, and that's partly why he was referencing Noah here. He's tapping in to, or, or dipping his paintbrush in, in the imagery that they already kind of had in mind. He's tapping into these stories that this region was already familiar with, and he's using it to teach about Jesus and our commitment to Jesus. He's using this Noah water stuff to teach about Jesus and our commitment to Jesus. Make sense? So think about Peter's readers in those terms for a second. They were a minority, uh, like, like Noah's eight-person family, a little socially vulnerable group of people who trusted in God for salvation, like Noah's family. Trusted in God for salvation from his judgment while everybody around them even demons disobeyed and, and were amplifying sin and evil. This is Genesis 6. Um, like Noah's family was saved for, from all of that through water, uh, so are Christians who understand that we need the victorious resurrection of Jesus to be saved from that judgment. Okay? And that's where the baptism piece comes in. I know it feels like we're going all over the place, but we're just rolling with Peter's punches here. I want to be really clear that what Peter is and is not saying, okay, Peter is not teaching baptismal regeneration. He's not saying that baptism is the thing that saves you. That idea is not true. That's not what Peter's teaching. What he is saying is that baptism symbolizes the flood water of death through which you look to Jesus for salvation. Not just the removal of like moral dirt on the outside. Baptism isn't just a bath. It's not just an external physical ceremony. It is a pledge that says, I will live like I've been cleaned from the inside out. It says, God, this is a prayer that says, God, I believe that Jesus is righteous and victorious and my Savior and my King who brings me into your presence, who forgives my sin, who cleanses my conscience. And now, God, I pledge to you, I will live out of that clean conscience. I will live according to that life-giving, life-changing washing that you have given me graciously from, through, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what Peter's preaching here. So if you're thinking about baptism, and you haven't done this yet, this is what it is. This is good teaching on baptism. This is what you do. It's not just a religious ritual. It's not the thing itself that saves you. It is what you do to acknowledge and to announce the cleansing, the forgiveness, the salvation, and the new life that God gives you through the resurrection of Jesus. And it's a commitment to stop being driven by sin and to start instead walking by the will of God. That's what he's saying. 
And if that sounds like something that you're ready for, talk to me, talk to Andy, any of our leaders, elders, anybody, really. We'll get you connected, ready to go, prepared to make this statement uh, that I trust in the resurrected Christ for my salvation, for my cleansing. And I commit to living out this cleansed conscience, this new life in him. That's what this is doing. The risen Christ is the one who brings us in and cleans us out. That's what 1 Peter 3, 18 to 22 are saying. And we saw that we're brought in to God because the righteous Christ suffered once and for all for the sins of the unrighteous. That's you and me. Praise the Lord. He did this through his death and resurrection and his ascension to heaven, announcing his victory and supremacy over demons. That's what this is saying. And the victorious resurrection of Christ is the only thing that cleans us from the inside out, saves us from the waters of judgment and death, uh, like Noah and the ark. The risen Christ brings us in and cleans us out. The risen Christ also puts an end to sin and gives us new spiritual life. He stops sin. Done. Enough. He says, I want to restart you on my path so that you can follow the will of God and have new life in me that can never be taken from you. That can never be taken from you. That's what verses, uh, that's what chapter 4, 1 to 6 are going to show us. Let's look down at that. 4, 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. You and me. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, detestable idolatry. <clears throat> and now they think it's strange that you don't plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation. And they heap abuse on you. But they'll have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those as Christians who are now dead, so that they might be judged, die according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. Imagine if the Golden State Warriors or the Bruins uh, were to go back out onto the court or the ice like this afternoon and start trying to score points. That's ridiculous. The game's over, right? You get no points for for that, for trying to score after the finals, the cup is, is over. Game's over. NBA championship is done. The winner's been decided. The Stanley Cup has been awarded. You know, scores are final. You can't take shots after the buzzer. We're done. And as Christians, sometimes we feel like those teams, Warriors, Bruins, like we're the loser. Uh, we go home beat up with a broken jaw and blown out Achilles and ACLs, you know. Some of you saw that. Yet because Jesus has won on our behalf, in our place, for us, when we couldn't win on our own, right? We know that we don't have to try to go back out there and score. Saying, I want to, you know, make my life better on my own terms. I want to try to make my own way to victory by my own rules, you know? I don't have to go back out there and compete and fight. The game's been won by Jesus. And it wouldn't be appropriate. It wouldn't make sense. It would show that we don't understand the rules here of the game we keep trying to uh, play something that Jesus already put an end to. And so it is with sin. You know, Jesus already beat it through his suffering. He said, it is finished. And so we arm ourselves with that same attitude or insight when we suffer as well. That's what verse one, 4, 1 is saying. Our, our difficulties in life, in other words, as Christians... It can't be occasions for us to try to get back out there and on the court and take shots to make ourselves feel like winners. Instead, we identify with the victorious winner, Christ, and say, Jesus, I'm willing to suffer for the glory of your name. And I realize that that means I, I'm st I've stopped being controlled by sin, and I'll continue in the new start, the new life that you've given me. That's verses 1 and 2. And then verse 3 clarifies that and said, says, you and I, Christians, we've spent enough time being driven by sin, sexual impulse, alcohol, overvaluing and worshiping money and power and careers and cars and stuff. You know, enough already. That's what this is saying. You don't need to spend another minute being carried along and driven and compelled, 
given over to, led by the will of the flesh, all those desires that are just uh, sinful and, and temporal, temporary. We, so that means you, know, we, you don't swear anymore. You know, your tongue doesn't control you. You have the Holy Spirit to control your mouth. In the same way, you don't, we don't gossip anymore. We've, we've been giving a, a new life. We do a whole new thing. We have a new start in, with our new life in Christ. We don't get drunk anymore. We don't look at explicit material. Jesus has stopped sin and given us a new start. That's what this is saying. So this might raise the question, can I still go to that same hairdresser I used to go to where all the gossip and buzz is, is kind of flying around in there? Is that still an appropriate place for me to be as a Christian? Yeah, sure. But not as a participant, as a missionary, right? Yeah. Can you still hang out with your friends who you smoke pot? Mostly, yeah. You might have to step outside a second to avoid the secondhand high, you know what I mean? But they need Christians in their lives. They need to see Jesus through you, you know? They are probably really hungry for relaxation and peace and rest. You know where to find that. You know where to find the real thing, right? You have this eternal peace, perfect peace, eternal rest in God through Jesus who has brought you in. You have all this in Christ. And you can show them the greater, truer, heavenly peace without giving in to the sinful version of it. Can you still go to the same bar after work? It's a tricky one. Maybe, you know, but you're not going to give yourself over to it. Here, bartender, I just, you know, own me. Give me whatever you want. I'll just, I'll just chug it and give myself away to alcohol. You don't do that anymore. Uh, you don't drink competitively anymore. You don't use alcohol to wash your stress away. That's like people who do that are chasing a false spirit. Why would you do that when you have the real one? You know what I mean? Why do you think? Why is it called uh, wine and spirits? That's what people are looking for. You got the real deal. You don't need that. So choose to be led by that spirit, the Holy Spirit, uh, rather than the counterfeit, the knockoff so that your bar buddies can see the incredibly transformative work of Christ in you. They need that, okay? All this is saying, it's time to stop being driven by sin. Start walking by the will of God in that new start, the new life that he has given us. This is, this is what it can look like. But verse 4 says that this, you know, it's a big but, but the people around you, your bar buddies, your hairdressers, they might not love that that you're no fun anymore, you know? That you've, ch you've changed. What's wrong with you? You know, they might not like that. They might disapprove of that. They might rip on you. They might try to damage your reputation, kick you out, get you fired, treat you like trash because you don't do what they do anymore. But verse 5 is here to say, don't worry, friend. Don't worry, Christian. Don't be afraid because they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. That's why verse 6 as the gospel was preached, even to those Christians who have died. In other words, you know, even if Christians are judged by men and women and, and flesh to the point of martyrdom, losing your life for your faith in Jesus, we know, we don't have to be afraid of that, because we know we live spiritually forever with God. All this to say, followers of Jesus, you don't have to be afraid, because we know that the risen Christ has brought us in, cleaned us out, put an end to sin so you're done with that, and given us a new spiritual start, new life that can never be taken away. This means we're no longer compulsive participants in sin, but we're missionaries to our friends, to our superiors who are still stuck in it. This means that we look back on our baptism or forward to the baptism hopefully that's to come for us that we still need, and we remember, yeah, that wasn't just a ceremonial ticket to heaven. It's not that at all. That was a real profession of faith in the victorious resurrection of Jesus. It was a pledge, a commitment to live out, to demonstrate the clean conscience he gave me. That's what this means. This also means we have such great confidence in our new spiritual life, the new start that God gives us. We don't flinch at persecution, at pressure, even death. This means we've been brought into the safe and strong arms of the Almighty God. We don't have to fear spiritual demonic oppression because Jesus rose from the grave, went to heaven, 
sat down at the right hand of God and said, I win. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is a, man, this is such a rich passage. And you, it's really a privilege that you, for us to, to have this in front of our faces and, and get to spend minutes of our time to mine it and to see what you're saying to us. So Lord, we receive that, that you are uh, teaching us about the significance of baptism, the significance, the truth, uh, the encouragement and strength that comes from the work of Jesus, the suffering that he did before us, his righteousness for our unrighteousness, forgiveness of our sins, the internal cleansing and the new life that he offers us. We praise you for that. What a gift. But we see that, we accept that, we believe in that, we want to live our lives like that's true. So Lord, by the power of your spirit, would you please help us to do that? Would you please uh, remind us, we don't have to be afraid because of your victory. You've already beaten the things we're afraid of. You've already put an end to the sin that has tended to, uh, to drive us forward. You said, nope, we're done with that. I give you a new start, a new way of life. Or we want to walk in that, to glorify you, to bear witness to what you've done through Jesus Christ on the cross, and his resurrection, his glorious ascension, his victory over demons, over evil, over darkness. We want our lives to be a testimony to all of that, to a world that is disobedient and dark, that desperately needs to see what that looks like. Lived out in neighborhoods, in the workplace, the hospital, the classroom. Lord, would you use us to point people to the Jesus who did all of that in our lives? We love you. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.